This episode of The Rock Block is brought to you by Exit In, Nashville's premier independent music venue for the last 50 years and counting, and TechWorks, a Nashville-based event production company providing full-service decorative lighting, stage lighting, professional sound, and audiovisual production support for all types of events, big and small. In the late 70s and early 80s, an underground music scene developed in Nashville that has continued to inspire and reverberate throughout the world. Today we're going to talk to the people who are at the heart of the scene and take a deep dive into old school Nashville rock and roll. Welcome to The Rock Block, an incomplete oral history of Nashville rock and roll with Jonathan Bright and Frank Sass. There are those who say rock and roll is there to make you feel good bollocks it's there to help you wrench a toilet bowl out of the floor and aim it at a dense livid throng of miscreants gutter punks and unwashed rock and roll imbeciles that's when music is best when it thins the herd and separates the men from the boys and the girls from their values such rock and roll was made in nashville back when giants walked the earth ching chinging their spur laden cowboy boots across the rock block and no giants walked taller and with more jovial malevolence than Jason and the Nashville Scorchers. Pioneers. I was just telling Pioneers. Pioneers. <laughs> I was telling Frank that the legendary cat show in the parking lot. Which yeah. one? There's two. The one where really? I saw both. The yeah. one where Jason climbed the uh, billboard. That's the only one that I know. But uh, I was like, yeah, there were probably two, three thousand of us there, and like, there's 250,000 people who said, oh, it's the greatest show I've ever seen. <laughs> the fuck are you out there? Well, we played there twice with the White Animals, right? Or, uh, no, no, Steve Earle and somebody else and us was the second one. One year, I think a semi-driver actually blocked West End off. We actually closed West I End off. I think that was the year, that was the first one? I just don't think it was the second one. The second one was big. tooth out one time too. Oh, yeah, the one, the first one's where he knocked his front tooth out. Yeah, because I remember yeah. having a skateboard and riding right down through West. He he or, came out on stage, of course, full of piss and vinegar. Grabbed the mic stand, hit his front boom. tooth, and Ow. he didn't start singing. And he turned around and looked at me, and I mean, the front tooth was sheared off at the gum line. It was like, oh god, <laughs> downbeat, you know, <laughs> off two, the road. Three, four. <laughs> yeah, like, oh god, that's gotta hurt, you know. <laughs> but there were two there were two cats records uh, things with the scorchers they were great is there we, is uh, there we better film? stop and uh, oh we're oh, not there recording is, no not yet <laughs> oh i am i don't know if she is oh are well, we we're rolling oh, then good then boom there we go all action right, let's get into this shit you know all those terms don't. action yeah, action <laughs> anyway thank you guys for coming down and doing this we and frank were talking about doing this stuff and what better place to do it than the exit in? I think it's turning 50 this year. It's really? Say. And you guys were pretty much, the, I mean, what better people to start with and what better place oh, to do it? So We've when, had fun in this building. Yeah. You guys, you played here, right? You ever been on this we, stage before? Twice, maybe? Yeah. Twice? Yeah, I don't remember looking like this. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you, uh, when did you, you guys met when you were young? Like, are you from here, Jeff? Yeah, I was born here and, uh, I just kind of uh, migrated to West End, to Frankenstein's and stuff. And first gig I did I actually was with, first club gig was with Tom Littlefield at Frankenstein's when it was a country bar. And then like two years later, it's this punk rock thing that we discovered. And that's where I met him. And you were born I, in Germany, right? I was born in Würzburg, Germany, yeah. But I, the first time I saw Jeff, was at a Battle of the Bands over in South Nashville. Yeah. Perry and I played in some <laughs> other thing, uh, what, some high school thing we were doing uh, with the Save My Life, I'm Going Down for the Last Time. Right. All that kind of shit. Jeff was playing with stickers, Billy Stickers and somebody, it was like behind the police precinct, they never played a note, a fight happened and the cops showed up. <laughs> and it was just like, wow. I want to play with them. Yeah, it was, it was Never one played of those nights. I just remember that something with the power, and the band was called the Electric Boys, pre-Electric yeah, Boys. Right. And uh, some fucking DJ. No, you can say yeah, something. Okay. Yeah, we're clear, some yeah. fucking DJ comes on, the power comes back on, and he says, we should have maybe gotten electric men. 
And we were like, fuck you, you <laughs> battle of the bands, fucking bullshit. <laughs> and I looked around, and the drummer was just staring at his drums, and he just destroyed them. And the next thing I knew, the police were carting him off. That it was, was the end it, of our battle. Perry, Perry and I was like, Jesus Christ, what the fuck is that? You know? I got. I want to play with him. So you, he's the guy. But there, things are going to happen with him. Did you yeah. grab him right after that? No, no, say? no. But I knew who Jeff was at that point, right. and we literally. So how did of, how did you approach him then? Actually, to be quite honest, Stickers brought me in when y'all were rehearsing at O'Donnell's Music downstairs. One night, me and Billy had been out drinking beer all day. They had a, an Electric Boys rehearsal, and Stickers took me to the rehearsal and said, you're now the singer. I quit. Yeah, because, I, I mean, I had met him. He was playing. He was With Joe. He replaced Bone. Bone had a broken leg from yeah. a car accident or something. In the rats. Right. And he was playing drums, and he... I saw him the first day, I saw him, he had a pitcher of beer, drinking from the pitcher instead of a mug, and I was like, that's that's happening. So that was your point where you're like, I want to play with that yeah, guy. Yeah, I'm going to play with that guy. And then Stickers, you know, his, his attention span is like, you know, fucking a millisecond. He was done with it before it ever got started, and, and Warner said, I'll sing, I'll sing. whatever. I don't know so. what I'm doing, I'll sing. So, how hard were, can it be? <laughs> so, Jeff, you were playing guitar. Yeah. And you were the drummer. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, I no, was singer. a singer Lead and singer. wanted to play some guitar, but Jeff was by far at that point, Jeff whipped our, all of our asses with the guitar. And um, somehow, towards the end of that, Perry kind of got involved a little bit. I know I was sneaking Perry into Frankenstein. He was like 14 fucking years old. Right. You know? Yeah, we would go see him at Cone High. Yeah. Uh, doing like some auditorium gig on Friday night. More for, than a fee. Yeah, yeah, doing some cover band shit. <laughs> Perry and, could do it. He could do that. But shit. I remember yeah. one night he he had on uh, like this, you know, blazer jacket, and he turned around. Do you yeah. remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it said Cone Number, number one. one. He had painted on the back of the jacket, and we were like, Yeah, he's working it. You know? <laughs> David Lee Roth. Yeah. So what what year was was are we looking at right? Seventy eight, seventy nine. Seventy eight, seventy nine. Right. Yeah. So this is this is now a couple years from the, you know, the, the most people look at like the timeline of things. You know, your, your dolls and then the, you know, the Ramones and then the the London things. So the London yeah. thing had had happened couple years from 77 then 76 77 and now here it is 1979 Nashville Tennessee yeah. what are you what are you doing what what are you listening to and and what are the other bands in town playing well I, I know by hanging out with stickers uh, you know my whole teens we had the dolls I mean it was no different to the, the first Van Halen and the Dolls, it was all rock and roll then. It wasn't like the sub mm -hmm. you know, gen genre type thing. Uh, so we, we had had, you know, Iggy, fucking Metallic KO, right. and, and the Ramones. I remember hearing the Ramones over there the first for the first time at Billy's, and it was like, yeah, shit's awful fast, you know? Right. But we were kind of like... Into the underground. He always got the, the things straight from London or, or Japanese imports or uh -huh. wherever he got the, you know, all this music. But we we were kind of like, what were some of the bands we were playing? I mean, you said one time it was a basically Green Day. No, dude, what we were trying to do... Became Green Day. Became Green Day, yes, exactly. <laughs> so... We were playing like the Dickies. Sure. I mean, it was punk rock heart, but we wanted some song. We wanted some lyrics. Some hooks. You know, yeah. We wanted some hook. Melody you know, and all that. You know, Buzzcocks. I, need... well, I don't think we did any Buzzcocks in that band. It was a Generation X. Uh-huh. Uh, Sylvain, Jail Sylvain. Out of Memphis. <laughs> uh, what was that band, Undercover, that, that you, you got me covered? Remember that song? What band? Oh God, I don't know. She probably could play it. Yeah, <laughs> there was just there, there was a mixture of stuff where uh, my generation. We were doing versions of my sure, generation, right. punked up versions. Yeah, of yeah. The who. Uh, and I remember Billy. I mean, the bass player was Greg Hurston, 
His yeah. father's like a, a great guitar player named, by the name of Kelso Hurston. Well, he had this fucking 60s tally, this black 60s tally that was just primo. And Billy decides he's going to play it in Frankenstein's. So we're doing My Generation. He didn't hit a note on the guitar. He just started banging this fucking 60s tally on the floor. <laughs> oh my God. The knobs flew off. <laughs> oh, of it. no. And, and Greg's eyes were just like, yeah, sure. You're sure. destroying the guitar. We had to take it away from him. But uh, it, it, was, it was like teenage angst, you know? It was like. Okay, we can get out. And we were drinking age now. I mean, I remember we were both. It was on, still eight, 18, right? That's yeah, oh, yeah was, drinking age was 18 right, back then. Right. And, and we so could, you could push we, it 16 and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I remember we were both on unemployment. <laughs> and we just fucking basically God. sign our checks over to Rick Champion at Frankenstein's. Oh, yeah. And we'd drink all week and, yeah. and spend all the money. You should explain Frankenstein yeah, to where, people that don't. Where where was that on West it was End? It was over on you know oh, where the West Catholic End. bookstore is? Yeah. Yes, it was there. underneath the Catholic bookstore. Yeah, just a, it was like a CBG type thing. Uh, it was tiny. I it mean, was, it wasn't even yeah. bigger than the stage. Didn't hold a hundred people packed, you know. But, but REM played there. Yeah, what was that band from Louisville, Vietnam? They, uh, they yeah, they decent. played there. Uh, you had Clover Bottom. The Rats, File 13 with Barry Phelps, who was the and original drummer, and Jason and the Scorchers, Pre Perry. Um, uh, Electric Boys, um, there was a band of the Jap Sneakers. There was Japanese yeah. Sneakers. My, my buddy Rob Hoskins tells me the first time he heard Eaton Rifles yeah. uh, from, from the jam, he was in in Murfreesboro at Main Street or, or yeah. some, someplace like that. And he was the other day. And he said, yeah, Japanese Sneakers, that was the name of the band. Yeah, that, that, wasn't Ronnie Douglas in there? Yeah, I think he played drums in that band. And uh, Joe, that's how I met, I mean, that's how I became familiar with the, the Ramones, was Joe, the Rats was just Nashville's version of the so, Ramones, or, or wanted to be. Right. So jo Joe Blanton. Joe Blanton, right. yeah. So I'm about, I'm seven or eight years younger than you guys, so I was too young to even sneak in at that yeah, point. Yeah, sure. But uh, was it much like later on that the scene, there were... 10 or 15 people in bands that showed up at every gig, every gig. and every there'd be gig. five yeah. or six yeah. other people that would just be there but oh, yeah. everybody there was were, just there in would bands. be a couple of straight chicks that come in there and then be running for the door right yeah. you know <laughs> right. oh yeah uh oh, it yeah. was a, it was a just a party it was like a party at a club yeah when you think I well mean, i mean we when, knew when rem played there the first time they slept on the floor they couldn't afford a hotel they slept on the on the floor hell joe tells the story rem opened up for the rats the first time they played there, you know. Wow. That's crazy. So oh, yeah. then it gets, uh, you, you guys do that. And once you started playing together, how did, before Jason came to town, did you do anything that even hinted at Scorchers type shit that led into you doing that? Or was it just, were you just <laughs> doing the kind of punk rock shit <laughs> until he, clearly there's a story in there yeah, somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Let's have it. I'm going to tell my version, then Je Jeff can tell his version. I want to say this first publicly. I've never said this before. One of the things that, to me, about Jeff was he had the cool record three months before you knew about it. By the time he was done with the band and you got the record, he was on to the next band. Jeff was always that guy. That happened yeah. to me when Appetite for Destruction came out. Yeah. There was a chick in town that knew Jeff who was in L.A. at the time. I heard Guns N' Roses a year before it ever came out. Oh, yeah. So I, oh, yeah. I, I feel Jeff was like, always yeah. on the front edge of, of the, those of us. That Jeff knew when, by the time we got into it, Jeff was already to the next thing. The Scorchers. We had a thing called the Idiots that we did. Basically, it was a good reason to get together and drink beer. <laughs> We did a lot of that. <laughs> we did a lot of beer drinking. Barry, Belts, theme, Barry right. Belts played back drums or Perry. Jeff, myself, three piece, basically but, taking country songs and just. Yeah, but you were, you, we were doing like Rhiannon and shit by Fleetwood Mac. And Glenn was singing. Glenn was singing, that's right. My little, my little brother. Right, so and taking the piss out of it, basically. He was playing bass on about half of it, and then we'd switch to guitar. But go my ahead. My dad come through one day we were doing a Hank Williams thing and my dad walks through the basement stops listens to us when we're done he looks over at Jeff he says if you boys actually got serious with that shit you'd have something 
and Jeff, it actually clicked with Jeff. The rest of us busted out laughing like, yeah, right. Right. It clicked with Jeff. Well, how, how I remember it is, we, like he said, I mean, he had a paper route <laughs> and a Vegas station wagon yes, and, <clears throat> and a hot case of beer in, yes. the, in, the, in the back at all times. So we would ride around throwing these papers. He would do the paper route and we'd just drink, listen to ACDC. Yeah. yeah, hell yeah. Well, once we started, you know, after, I, I don't remember, was this the idiots were during this or we? It was in between the Electric Boys and the Scorchers happening. Okay, so we were doing these gigs. Uh, Pickup gigs. Yeah, like opening for the white animals. Well, and stuff. one of them, remember the piggies had to cancel somebody's relative had died or whatever. The piggies was like <laughs> Nashville's. You know they were they the were they were a real band. Yeah. You know they could actually play and tune their instruments and, yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Had well, a crowd, right. they asked us <laughs> one night we covered for them at Cantrell. Somebody had a death in the family, something real. They couldn't play day of show, and I'll never forget the sign. Uh, we can't be here tonight. Please come in and enjoy our our, our, our friends, friends, the idiots. You know? <laughs> and, and we were we were just aimlessly pissing people off. <laughs> and and uh, but anyway, we were playing. Please release me. Yeah. And Barry was doing like this fucking and I was doing like Eddie. I, we, Eddie I, switched, I, I switched to bass and I was just doing doom, 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 doom. And he was like, just like, please release me. Let me go. <laughs> like, you know, a, a southern oh, preacher or something. <laughs> and it was just the bass and drums and it would go through a verse. When it got to the chorus, he would fucking just go clang on a full op guitar and then do the chorus with him like rock. And, and it was like, I kind of saw what his father was talking about because it was just a good melody that it was over simple chord progressions. And that's kind of what the Scorchers were. I mean, there were- That's what good rock and roll is. Yeah, I mean, there were some more minors and shit in the Scorcher shit to color it, but I mean, I think that was the original, you know, idea. That was, that was the original idea. And when Jason moved to town, he he started a band. He had a, Barry was his drummer. Barry Feltz played drums. Jack Emerson, who became our manager, played bass. And he had a law student. I don't know what his last name was. His first name was Will. He was going to Vandy Law School. Right. Um, he played lead guitar or guitar and Jason was in the middle and he played two shows with that band. One of them was opening for R.E.M. which you saw. I, I saw both of them. I oh, saw, did you see? I saw R. the Carl was Perkins the, show. The and, and uh, the Carl Perkins was at Bandy, right? At Bandy, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and I, I just remember him like with a super long mic cord. Oh yeah, I, I, the one yeah. I saw, the Carl Perkins show, he, he spent half the night in the audience with his guitar and the, the mic stand where he had the, the gooseneck thing on it, yeah. he wouldn't play without a gooseneck for years. So was know? the band like that, or was this basically just Jason, Jason taking the mic crazy over just... the top? I mean, Jack was holding on with both hands. Right. Barry was a singer trying to play drums. He, he had, it was cool, right. you know. And I, I don't remember much about Will's playing, but it was just like, wow, man, I got to play with that guy. Was it more countryish, like straight up, or it was rockabilly? Kind of rockabilly, or rockabilly. It's like I had met him. Scott Nelson and Barry and I were over in Barry's, we lived beneath his grandmother. Over in West Nashville? Yeah, yep. and we would we'd just get fucked up and, you know, and hang out and we'd play some and we'd you know, smoke quaaludes, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we would just, and, and Jack Emerson called and asked if he could bring Jason by. So, if we'd play a song with him. So he shows up, he's got on the bolo tie and, you know, early Jason. He's bouncing off the walls, and somehow I, I started hanging out with him. He worked at a pizza place. He was giving me free pizzas. You know, he called me and said, "You want a pizza? Come get it." And, Hell yeah! And uh, so we had hung yeah. out, you know, and talked about rockabilly and and, and stuff like that. But uh, Barry started playing with him like seriously, and. I was like, well, you, you know, I know him when, when I come play. He's like, no, we're not drinking at rehearsals. We're not. We're serious about this. So finally, I went and, and played, but I, I, 
the guitar style I was playing, it, it didn't really work with that. So I said, well, I'll just, you know, I can do Jerry Lee Lewis bass lines or whatever. And then I, I thought about him. And it's like, well, he, you know, those, what is it? The Luther Perkins Luther did Perkins, this bang, yeah, bang, that. bang, yeah. bing, yeah. bing. That, I knew he could do that. I so. played a lot of country p music with my parents. So. Well, yeah, but weren't you a drummer in that band? Yeah, but I was, you know. Absorbing I, it? I, yeah, I mean, I had my parents jamming country music down my throat as a young kid. At least they were putting a good country music. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, I was fortunate. And Did you, were you kind of standoffish about that shit when you were a youngster? Like, I don't want to hear any more fucking country no, music. No, 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 there was, there was a point that. in my teenage years, about the time I started driving, where, you know, I was still in my parents' band, and I was whatever was missing that week. Right. One week I'd be the drummer, the next week I'd be the lead guitar player, out, out at the Moose Lodge and shit, you know. But it was all equal. He was all equal at this shit. Good. I mean, it was yeah. just like... Wow, it was, it was more than adequate. I mean, it was shocking. <laughs> right. Do it. Well, and there's my style, right there. How it's just more than more adequate. More than adequate. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was, but people move around on these instruments. He was like good at all of them. And once we got him in the Scorchers, it just it had this thing. And and we had both been doing pop bands. Remember yeah. that? Show? Yeah, yeah. I had done the press thing. Yeah, and I played with yeah. Richie Owens for a yeah. year or so. The Resistors. Yeah. 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 So that was kind of winding down, but Clyde wanted us to do, a, he wanted Warner and I both in the same band. Right. To try to get a record deal, or whatever, with. Uh, Go be Rick Springfield. Yeah, just yeah. the contemporary pop music. So we yeah. were doing that. And then the Scorchers thing, I don't think we were really taking it that serious. And I, I must say, it, with all these bands with stickers and the electric yeah. boys, the yeah. idiots, whatever, it's like this is the flavor of the week. This is art statement that I can get, you know, a laugh out of this shit. And then on to the next thing. But there was something magic about it. Yeah. And we, we played at KO's. And I was in a stand-up bass. <laughs> K.O. K.O. Jam? Yeah. yeah. Murphy's yeah. Yeah. Murphy's yeah. Was, the was... first The first gig with Perry in the band, the band that everybody knows, uh -huh. was New Year's Eve at K.O. Jams of like 1981 that become 82, yeah. I think. That's the first gig with the band that everybody knows. But we yeah. had played one there before yeah. with Barry. With Barry. Was, was Bruce... Yeah, okay. Bruce. Yeah, 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 right. Bruce so it. had 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 you had you met? Obviously, you met and met him prior to that. Oh yeah, we and, we and, we and knew stuff. him. I knew him. I used to work for him. He had a, a store he managed in in the mall called oh, I forget the name of it. Anyway, a clothing store like a, a hip clothing right, store. Right, right. So I worked with the, him like the Malcolm McLaren of the yeah, yeah kind of yeah. It, it, it's <laughs> like he would throw us some cash and and uh. To, you know, I built some shelves there. One helped him build some shelves. Well, I didn't mean to interrupt that, but but he's going to be a, certainly a, a featured uh, name. I Bruce feel Bruce been there, done that. Bruce, got the t-shirt. Yeah, Bruce yeah. Fitzpatrick. Well, every good yeah. band we've seen in town, pretty yeah. Rick through. Champion, yeah. yeah, all the fucking cool bands that we saw. Yeah, I, I mean, era. Bruce, Still I've known there. before before that. I remember when he told me he was going to do it, and and we needed to come play, but. That night, Barry was playing drums, and it's like there was an energy, you know, in the audience. And I, I walked over to Warner, I was like, what do you think, you know? And it's like, yeah, it's cool. And we played another song, I went back to Barry, I said, this shit's rocking. <laughs> he said, fuck you, this is the worst shit I've ever played. <laughs> and I quit. He quit at the gig, and I That's think he regretted that is. later, but. He, he, he did, he did. But. He, yeah, and then in comes Perry. Yeah, after brought, that. brought in Perry. Well, how quickly did you make the first EP once you got that done? The very first EP, the Reckless was Country real, Soul. Real it, it, there was anything three or four days. Yeah, three maybe. or four days. Perry only knew those songs. So when we cut that record. That was all he knew. Basically, of one gig, and you're like, "This shit's good." Yeah, yeah. let's go record it. Jack was organizing all that. I mean, the way we recorded that. And Perry had a job at the. At he, the we had to be done house. at a certain time because he had to go to work. Yeah. yeah. You know? So basically, it's someone's living room, and we faced all the amps, Warner's amp and my amp, to the center of the room, and then Perry's at one wall, just pointing in at one or two mics, I yeah, guess. it wasn't a lot. It was a four-track. Yeah, and Jason was in the hallway with the harmonica and the vocal mic, and it was like a couple of takes, and Perry had to go to work. <laughs> you know? 
And then, so did you, was there a period, a long period of time between that first EP and EMI getting involved? Two years. Two years? Two years. Did yeah. you guys tour at all during that time? Or was Constantly. it basically? Yeah. You, like Constantly. the South, Southeast? Jason had a, a three on the tree van <laughs> and we put 300,000 miles on it in two years. You know, we broke went, the axle. Yeah, went everywhere we could go. So this is 81? 81, 82. 81. By 83, yeah. we had a record deal with EMI. Yeah, I mean, we were, I, I, I didn't have an apartment. I was just living in a car because I could, like, get canned green beans and corn and things like that and just throw them in the trunk. And when I, if we had a couple of days off, yeah. I'd sleep in the car, if, you know, if I couldn't find a place to stay. And then we were back at it again, like three weeks at a time. Yeah. Like the Midwest, we did a lot. Yeah, a lot like of it, Midwest, East Coast, South. You know, we you, probably played with REM a hundred times yeah. in those two years. Well, that's that's what I was going to ask you. Who who were some of the groups that you were on the same bill with, or the same or circuit? The same. So right, you're talking uh, REM. All right, we did a lot of gigs with REM, and we did some gigs with the Circle Jerks. Yeah, still friends with those guys. You know, went to went to Texas pre-record deal. We played five shows opening for the Ramones. I, your, uh, the Fearless <laughs> Leader's uh, latest uh, record there, his last one, come out with the song. Uh, oh, God, yeah. God yeah. bless Ramones. So the Ramones the, the story. Was, was before the record deal. Yeah, we didn't yeah. have a record deal yet. Yeah. Well, that, was, was, that was like a lucky break. That I, Did they call us or I, something? I, I, I don't know. That's what the song says. By the, the end, story, by the end yeah. of the five shows, we were literally playing on their gear. Our shit was all broke. Right. We were playing on their gear, and their roadies were like, they never let anybody use their gear. We were playing on their gear. Oh, dude, yes. the, the first, first fucking night, we go to <laughs> Beaumont, Texas. Beaumont, right? Texas. And they're having a beauty contest. In the club we're going to play club. tomorrow night. They said, come on down, you can drink for free. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. So, boy, did I drink for free. And I just remember that Perry had a glass of ice. We were There were these bleachers, like, you know, high school. Oh, yeah. This basketball. is one of the big Texas clubs, 2,500, 3,000-seat club. So they, they do rodeos in there at the same time? Yeah, <laughs> probably. Yeah. yeah, it's one of those things. That, sitting on these bleachers and Perry takes a glass of ice and goes whoom and throws it in my face well the ice got on the bleacher where my feet were and when I went to stand boom slipped the cop was watching me and busting me put me in jail and or, or told me come outside when I went outside it was public drunkenness because I you know public sidewalk whatever and Texas Perry, Texas yeah. Texas Beaumont <laughs> the first night you got arrested. Ronnie Douglas got arrested. Perry got arrested. I go back. Jason's at the hotel. I go back to the hotel. We, we no longer have that hotel. <laughs> I end up, girl that I'm with from the bar that was just giving me a ride back, lets me go home with her because I have nowhere to go. <laughs> have no idea where we're now staying. And this is pre-cell phone, we, so everybody's separated. Yeah, and we haven't, separated. We yeah. haven't played minute one of the Texas tour with the Ramones. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> yeah, the first night. Then the second night, the first night of playing with them, it's like I had a bass. And I break bass strings. I don't know why I break bass you strings. You don't know why? No. But I, I don't break <laughs> guitar strings, but I break bass strings. The first night, boom, we have no spare strings. Mongo, yeah. the Mongo. roadie that wore the pinhead thing, Dee Dee's roadie, he... Uh, he said, I'll, I'll put a string on it. And he goes and gets a string, and he puts it and gives it back to me. Later that night, Dee Dee was you know, in the dressing room, and he's like, fuck, if you break another one, just grab my bass, you know? The next night, I break another one. Yeah, I <laughs> grab Dee Dee's bass. Yeah. Yeah. The management went nuts <laughs> about, he's got Dee Dee, Dee Dee's bass almost stopping the set, you know? Uh, but he chilled him out. But I think maybe the best part of that story is you went on tour and didn't have any extra strings. No. <laughs> Dude, there was none of that yeah. shit back then. Just, you know, we literally tutors. went across Texas. We were getting like $5 a day for peanut butter and uh, jelly yeah. or bologna. Yeah. You know. I want to know if they, had a, if they had a case for the sign. Of what? A case for the sign. The, I know the, they, the Gabba yeah, Gabba I, Hayes I mean, sign. You know? Yeah, it, it, it was like... Maybe went in with the drums or something. They had a couple of those tub cases. That they had a case for the for the stage coats 
because when they opened that case, yeah, it, it was, was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> they take off the dry leather jacket, put yeah. on last night's jacket, and go it's out there, there to play, and it was just like, oh my God. You, know? you, you got you to gotta admit, though, that Dee Dee and Johnny, they, had, they can last for probably five, six songs oh, before yeah. they have to come oh, off, yeah. which is still impressive. Yeah. You know, to, to play that hard in the full regalia. You know, I think the first time I saw the Ramones play is when they played here, when the stage was on the other end. Yeah, the I was telling entrance was still that. back here. The stage was up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What year would that oh, be? Oh, good God. I don't know. <laughs> I was too young to get in. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. I know I, I, bought, snuck I, bought, in. I bought tickets the first time. They only sold. I, I bought tickets day of show and got like ticket four or something. They didn't play the first time. The second time they did. Yeah. I, I just remember. I was telling Jonathan, you, there used to be, the stage was like in, against that front door. Right. I, I don't even know if that door's there anymore. It's but, there. Um, and there was a, a window at the end of the bar for the waitress station. And you could come in, you know, if you could sneak in that side door and just kind of shimmy over to a corner into the shadows, yeah. you kind of peek through the, the window. So I watched some of it and I, I got bored with it and I went outside and actually leaned against that door yeah. and, and felt Marky's kick going oh, yeah. all night. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, that, that was my first Ramon show. I mean, that's, that's obviously a, a crucial sort of thing, you know. I mean, at least it was for me, that kind of, you know, opened, opened up my eyes to that whole experience. You know, I saw him when I was 14, 15 years old in, in 1981. Yeah. You know, in New Pulse. And, right. And from there, that... A downward spiral, you know, ever since, you know, it's Ramones, then, you know, you learn about the clash and absolutely, the, you, then you get through the whole thing. And then, you know, uh, a young sophomore in high school, this, this fervor cassette comes out, you know, and, and, well, it's, it's from know. the same school. I exactly. Mean, it's like he had some twain going on from the country music with his parents, but same records wasn't it well yeah, sure i think it's easy to to combine a lot of that you know you got like the blasters and and the west coast sort of stuff going on uh and then the the rockabilly thing with the you know the stray cats robert gordon uh and you know the cramps uh -huh. even you we know were... so it's it's a lot easier to put you guys kind of in that larger family than other sorts of things it I, I seems think, natural yeah because we we did sh we did shows with the circle jerks you know or the the music wasn't compatible but the energy level that's what i was yeah, yeah they loved it for you know, some their, there's fans, a difference their fans between... fans actually absolutely dug us and, and we dug them there was know? a right. difference between you guys and like rank and file or something when you yeah. go to see it live because you could you know the records weren't like hardcore punk they yeah. definitely had that spirit yeah but when you saw the stage show, especially oh, early, the band, the it band was live. ridiculous, the and band I can't imagine. Live. It's kind of like ACDC playing punk, right? Yeah. You know, you well, can't deny were, it. The, it's the guys same. Originally, yeah. got they got thrown in the punk rock yep. thing and shredded know? it. But it's um, the band, the height of the Scorchers. You didn't know where to look. Yeah. You know, which was what we wanted. You know, you didn't know who to pay attention to. It was just one of those magical things, you know, that, that it's hard to describe. It just worked, and we just knew it. And remember the first time we played with Carrie, it was yeah. like... Yeah, oh, immediately. I, it was like, oh, my God. And, I mean, we're just playing like one, four, five, fucking yeah. tear it up or yeah. gone, 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 yeah. or one of those rockabilly songs, but you could just, you could feel it. And... Uh, knew it immediately, the chemistry thing. Yeah. You, yeah. You're, you're, you know... And you, when you play with a guy and you go like, eh, and you play with a guy and go, shit. But when you, you land, know, the, on, yeah, when you land on something like you guys had, it's there's all that, and there's an enormous amount of fucking luck that yeah. you guys just oh, bumped yeah. into. Yeah, I mean, hundred oh, percent luck. I mean, not, luck, not that I, you didn't remember, put in the work, but the right. personalities. I remember me, Perry, and Jeff playing on Perry's front porch outside hmm. on Forty of uh, Murphy Road, right? right? We're, we're going to be on TV one day. We're going to go tour the world. Like, yeah, right, sure. We did. Yeah. The, the funny thing about it is, is I remember reading about when the L.A. hardcore thing with the Circle Jerks, right. Black Flag, whatever, what, 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 yeah. all that yeah. shit. 
I remember reading about it, thinking, wow, they've created a scene, and then the next thing, we're in it. Yeah. And it wasn't anything, we weren't concentrating on being a hardcore band. It's just it somehow bridged over into that. And when Fervor came out, I mean, I was probably, what year did that come out, 84? 83. 83? First time, 83. Came 83. out, <laughs> came out yeah. two or three times. Six or oh, seven like times. Oh, we won the EP of the year three, twice, three, twice <laughs> in the New York Times. Yeah, I well, mean, the we, cassette, we won it with the independent version and, right. the, and the reissue with Sweet Marie. So. The, the cassette was great because it was the same on both sides. Yeah. And, and me and uh, Jimmy Brook from the, with the mannequins and stuff ride around in his links and we didn't have to switch the tape over. Oh, we, we just we, flip it sail. It, it flips it right. Start, we just listen to it. Song. Yeah. <laughs> but you guys, I mean, when that 83, 84, right around that time, you guys were fucking huge in Nashville just as far as like people looking up and go, holy shit. I mean, these guys are doing something beyond our little scene. They've stepped out of this stuff. I, but I part will, of the cool part is yeah. you guys were also very accessible in town for during that period while you were blowing up. Sure. You could bump into you guys. Well, I, we were If we were in town, we were out. Oh, yeah. All of us but Jason, we were out. I remember Jeff and I were all waited out. I think it was like, well, yeah, 1984 something. I mean, I've probably never even told you this, but me and one of my high school buddies yeah. ended up at a party at the Gray House, which uh -huh. you could probably do a whole podcast on. Yeah, the sure. Gray House. Sure. <laughs> but you were there. We were all hammered, and you were like, "Hell, I got to go to the exit in. Yo, boys, give me a ride down there." We're like, "Shit, it's warm out." It's like, "Sure." So we drank and we came to get in down here. And I remember coming up, and we were like, "Uh." We can't get in. We we're too young. And you look down and go, hell, boys, I'm a deputy sheriff in this town. <laughs> Walked by, kind of waved at the door. Like, she's like, it was Janet, I think. Yeah, and she was sure. like, go uh, on uh, in. Uh, but, yeah, sure. They, but you guys were basically deputies of this well, we, town we, for. We've got deputy sheriff badges from Faye Thomas. No shit. Yeah, back in those days. Fuck yeah. Tell this okay. story. That, well, in those <laughs> days, when we, got, when we got a record deal, right? they did some weird signing thing here in Nashville. And... Fate used to do that with bands, and we like all the key got, of the city or something. Yeah, kind of and shit. we all got deputy sheriff's badges, and for <laughs> Jeff and I, that hmm. was a license to kill. Uh, <laughs> so we brought we some the uh, police <laughs> brought some privileges with it. We I guess. brought privileges that we liked. Yeah, to get you, you know, out of tickets. And we used them as all. Yeah, oh yeah, there you go. Yeah. Especially Keith, back in those Keith days. Christopher tells the great story of getting pulled over with Carling Carter. Going up 65 at 110 miles an hour, he gets pulled over, pulls out his, his deputy sheriff's badge, <laughs> never even asked for an ID. Thank you, sir. Have a good evening. Yeah, it was kind of the hookup, yeah. you know. It was, it was the hookup in those days. Wow. Yeah. Did they have to yank it from you at any point for abusing the privilege? I don't know what happened to mine. <laughs> Got drunk and lost it. Probably. <laughs> Probably. And how, you, like, I don't, I don't imagine... Like, how did, Jason doesn't seem to me, I don't know him at all. I don't, I doesn't don't know seem how, like a I do not know with you. how he put up with you with fucking guys. I do not know how he put up with it. I don't know. Just, I don't know how he puts up with me now. Right. And I had drink 28 years. <laughs> a lot of patience, I guess, or just a focus that, I mean, I think the, the way the story goes is he came to Nashville because he didn't want to go to LA or New York and just be lost in the shuffle. Right. And, and plus he, you know, he's from the Dylan school kind of thing, the folky yeah. thing. So he just wanted a loud band behind what he kind of He had about. a vision. He had yeah, a vision. he did. And, and, uh, and he had some songs. Well, that's which Jeff was also I mean, involved in a lot of the that's songs. That's another thing everybody that was. kind of yeah. sets you guys apart with that is there's a few minor chords thrown in, and the lyrics weren't "fuck you, Reagan" constantly. Or, yeah, you know, yeah. you know, I'm I'm really actually <clears throat> kind of happy about. It. I, I mean, I, I've told you when we when Fervor came out, yeah. and we didn't get a PMRC fucking tag on it. Yeah. I was like we're dead in water because it, it's not yeah. going to sell the kids. It, it it's no profanity on it. Yeah, but you know that's me at twenty. 324 now I look back and some of the stuff that Jason wrote was really like prophecy kind of without having to be your typical get drunk and kill your mom right you know um, it's kind of weird that I look back on it now and, and 
I guess that's why he got so much recognition for the songwriting, uh, just because of some intellect about it that was... Well, it, it was a little different, too, than the just screaming and yelling at your parents and the, and the man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's my point. He, he, it was he, he, not he, fuck was you or yeah. the man's keeping us down or... Yeah. It's... Uh, but, you know, that, the, the countryside of the band, pray for me, Mama, I'm a gypsy now. Who's that from? Well, we wrote it together, right? I mean, but that's, um, that's the thing. It's like a lot of that stuff was just, you know, inspired by being on the road and thinking these thoughts, and then I would just blab this shit out, you know, and he would take it and... And like Warner, those those first records, Warner, it wouldn't have worked without his guitar playing. Period. <clears throat> well, and he didn't get a, a lot of credit as songwriter. I mean, that is something that I kind of always had a problem with. If it's a band, I like the Van Halen thing with yeah. twenty five. You yeah. know, REM R- equal R- split. R- you know, YouTube. Uh, but I mean, I think everybody contributed. And an equal amount of absolutely. Uh, well, of, if you're a, a real band, yeah. that's the case. Well, this was a real yeah, band. Yeah, because if you pull I mean, one the of sum, you guys the sum out, of something the part, changes. The some of the parts was larger than the four individuals. Mm. A, a special thing happened that didn't happen individually. Yeah, and you guys were kind of like, what were you up against? And I think about like the '80s and that time. Like Nashville was not, a, there, I mean, there were bands, but you can't think of any really Barefoot Jerry, maybe, but oh, no dude, really big bands dude, or a country dude, difference. It's a, a you singer. also have to remember, our first record deal come out of L.A. Well, right? DMI. yeah, they it was L.A. and New York. Yeah, but had, it wasn't a Nashville deal. Because Nashville seems to me is still kind of like that. There, it's never been a band town as far yeah. as what gets pushed. It's a singer or whatever with yeah. a band back sure. up. Well, it's and, easier to press push one guy, dude. Exactly. You know? But that's why, you know, when you hear a band band like you guys, it's just a complete different beast than even yeah. Dylan. You know, he puts yeah. together great bands behind him, but there's, there's no definitive the Bob Dylan band. If the yeah. drummer leaves, sure. the bass player leaves, everything sounds completely yeah, different. That was the thing. It, and it's like it was a three piece band. I mean, Jason didn't play that much. He, he strum on an acoustic probably wasn't, couldn't even hear it half the time. And, well, and our, trying and, to get it over the top yeah. of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Poor yeah. sound guy didn't stand a shot well, in hell, you know. I, so with that, obviously, purposely arranged, You, I mean, you, you wrote it, yeah. or it was written, basically. For, I mean, Jason's acoustic is there, but as soon as the show starts or halfway through, forget about it, yeah. it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I, I so mean, you're, you're basically a three-piece band, you know, Ramones, The Jam, oh, Police, yeah. with a, Matt with a, Moon, with Zeppelin, shit, whatever. No, crazy, yeah. shit crazy front man. Right. Jason didn't drink, didn't do drugs. He was bad shit crazy, you know. Yeah, he looked like he was being electrocuted. Oh, soon, oh, yeah. he was, and as soon as he got to the dress room, it was like, click. It's over. And every time you would talk to him or run into him, I remember the first, it, and another thing speaking about how accessible you guys were, uh, one of the first bands I was in, 91 Rock had the local show, mm-hmm. you know. We made our first cassette or whatever, got it played, our buddy was working that shit, yeah. played the song, but and the next afternoon, Jason had somehow found our number, called the band house that we lived in, I picked yeah. up the phone, I was like, hey man, this is Jason Ringenberg from the scores, I'm like, hey man, he's like, I heard your song. I just want to tell you guys I really enjoyed it, man. Keep up that's the good cool. work. That's Jason. Just out of the blue. Never talked to him yeah. again, but that's I'm sure Jason, he called dude. the DJ and was like, who are these guys? I'm going to give him a call. So, yeah. you know, but he, he doesn't resemble an interview or anything, his stage persona yeah. at all. I don't see how he, how he does. I've seen him do his solo show at like at the five spot when his le- yeah. the record come out. And he, even when he's by himself, he can't, he can't help himself obviously yeah the leg you see the leg starts moving and and it's just him and his acoustic but but he's still he's not sitting on a stool. right he's frenetic you know he, yeah. kinetic he, he's constant motion uh, crazy yeah i mean that that was the whole thing i mean outside of the songwriting it was a three ring circus basically it was you didn't know where to, and we prided ourselves on and it, it. you didn't know like where that. to look you know Perry wasn't going to get out outshone sitting on a drum stool. He was going to figure out how to be front and center exactly. too. Exactly. You know, and the others of us were kind of the same way. You know, it was just like, well, everybody had their. It's like uh, there's 
parts of that band that you guys didn't necessarily invent, but things that when you hear it, at least to me, it sounds like the Scorchers. It's Jeff's uh, Eddie Cochran rolling bass shit. Dude. It's fucking... If you uh, listen to my brand new record, you'll hear... It's Perry's... Play it like Jeff Johnson. Perry's pickup, that do ba do ba ba going yeah. up. That's... Your descending leads. Well, da, 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 da. That, that, that whole pop 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 and the da 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 it's all him. I mean, <clears throat> Perry basically copied his drumming I've heard and had a drum. lot more energy because Perry was <laughs> because from, from because <laughs> play drums all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Perry, no. Perry, I mean, Jeff said, Perry is one of those guys, uh, it, it was, it was, um, he was savant about music, dude. He could pick up a freaking trumpet, and in three minutes, he'd have a part. No idea what he was playing. He'd have a part. Right. I mean, a part. Yeah, Where's entertaining the mic? people with you him. Know. Um, he was a keyboard player and singer when I met him. Right. The original first time I heard him play drums, drummer didn't show up. So Perry's like, I'll play drums. It's like, oh, come on, dude. Sits down behind the kid. He's better than the drummer in the band. Fucking keyboard you know? players. Is he was, he was that guy, you know. Really good rhythm guitar player. Not a lead player, but he was a singing fool. Right. You know, his background vocal was amazing. Yeah, well, his voice was amazing. Was it a conscious effort on his part, like on the the Fervor record? And, and uh, I remember the the Showtime thing you guys yeah. did with REM and stuff. Yeah. He, it's just the kick, snare, and the floor tom. You yeah. know, there's not not even a rap <laughs> tom. You know, so <laughs> is is this was this out of necessity or two, two <clears throat> things? Two things. Band pack. Right. Was, we lost the stand up bass. Yeah. That because, because, two because, gigs well, out. We here. also lost the the main pickup for it, so it sounded like mm. shit. Too. Right. <laughs> the borrowed pickup for it, but van pack. Tom Tom never packed anywhere, and hard to get that roll going if you ain't got Absolutely. that one. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Slowed down the rolls. I remember in Memphis. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this. Oh, no. Antenna Club? Yeah, Antenna okay. Club. Okay. Perry is into Alex Van Halen, right? He so was into Van Halen hard. He's got, you know, That's several crazy. toms, yeah. a bunch of cymbals. And <laughs> I watched Jason in between every song. As he was talking to the audience, he carried a cymbal to the side of the stage. <laughs> when the gig finished, it was that kit you're the talking thing. about. <laughs> the toms and the cymbals were gone. Yeah. Now that's funny. Uh, Perry played shit out of it. Yeah. My my favorite my favorite one though that rock of the '80s Showtime thing. Okay, yeah. The big deal with that thing was you had to play live, and I'll never forget. I know there was there was like eight bands. They they filmed two shows at one time. Four bands a show, 15 minutes a pop. You played three, four songs. Right. One of the bands, and I don't remember which one it was, it was one of the keyboard bands. The guy was trying to explain, he's like, I do the records, I do everything. These people don't actually play. We need to pantomime the record. And it's like, well, this is a live show. You have to play. And the guy, the guy never got through. He's like, they don't play. They're <laughs> actors. They look really good behind the keyboards. And that guy looks really good with a guitar, but they're not musicians, you know? And the TV people looking at him like, well, they, the whole idea behind this show is you got to play live. Now, I don't know if they played or not, but probably not. Yeah, probably not. But I, I remember what, you guys, uh, both sides of the line, was. I, I remember, don't know what we played. You know, probably yeah, yeah, most definitely because you had the the big build and yeah. the, you know the snare yeah. drum thing and never uh, on the riser and, yeah. and all that. Uh, and then REM, yeah. same time period, everything they were on there and. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about some of the other bands from that time period. When you started to go out of town, where did you go? Uh, and so you, you mentioned earlier you played with REM a bunch. Yeah. Um, was that like several dates in a row, or were you just at the same club? I don't with know. them, we played. We pick up like several dates, but they were really good to us. You know, they were extremely nice to us. Yeah. REM was the first band we played with that I remember. You'd get paid a hundred dollars to come down and do an opening set at six eight eight, and they'd give you four hundred dollars of their money, and we got rooms down the road. We're gonna give you two of them. Didn't Nobody did solid that. Solid dudes. They yeah. were oh, all four, and they're still sing, solid dudes. Didn't yeah. Michael sing on uh, uh, Hot Nights in Georgia? Hot Nights in yeah. Georgia. Yeah. Michael Stipe sings BGVs. Speaking yeah. of, uh, I, that's just triggered something in my mind. I was talking to Doug Lancio a couple weeks yeah. ago. We were talking about the Scorchers <clears throat> and you and when he moved to town, blah, 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 long story. But 
he was talking about like he was in a cover band or they wrote a few songs. REM goes comes through town. Yep. Then of course everybody that's doing bands like all right, I'm gonna go write ten songs that sound like REM. REM. So right. they do that. But anyway, he was like, so we're going to play Cantrell's, and I had I hadn't met Warner yet, but he was always hanging out by the bar even when he wasn't there, just fucking hanging out. So Doug says he goes there. I think it was the three piece band or something, and you know. He, they started, he said, Warner pulls his chair out. And there's nobody fucking there. There's like five people there. Warner pulls his chair out and sits down like this. He's like, listens to a couple songs, looks up and goes, all right, I get it. Radio Free Franklin. And then walks <laughs> off. Radio Free oh. Franklin. Oh. Sorry, yeah. Doug. Hey. Sorry, bud. Great line. Anyway. But yeah, REM back in the day. So you did fervor. You guys got, you know, you boosted up from that. What's the difference between recording that and then going into doing your second one? Because you got good reviews. Lost and found? Yeah. And you guys, off of Fervor, pretty much, you went international, right? Yeah, That's where we you did. did. We, we were fortunate that Fervor had two sets of legs because we, we did it once independently when it was on Praxis. And then we added Sweet Marie to it, and it, it won the New York Times EP of the Year again. We, we got legs out of it, and we, uh, you know, MTV come along. You didn't have to have a good. You didn't have to have a good, D, uh, what do you call it, video. You had to have a video. We had one. So I we got played it. some, you know. MTV didn't have enough crap to fill up 24 yeah. hours a day with video, you know. How the fuck did Jason talk you guys into doing a Dylan song anyway? I, if I got to be honest, <laughs> yeah. if I'd have known it was we a Dylan know. song, I wouldn't have cut it. I wouldn't have cut it. It sounded no, like I, the Stones. It sounded like a Sticky Finger shit or something. <laughs> and. I'll never forget sitting there with Terry Manning when he said, wow, the Dylan song's going to mix out nice. And I went, what, what Dylan about? song? You know? He said, Sweet Marie. I was like, dude, that's the best song Jason's ever wrote. No, Warner, that's a Dylan song. I probably wouldn't have, I was so punk rock, I wouldn't have. That's what I was, I was thinking about I at the time. I probably would not have done it. That's hilarious. I'm sorry, Mr. Dylan. Uh, you know, Lost and Found, we were very fortunate while we were out touring Fervor, Lost and Found got, you know, we, the sophomore jinx most people have became our uh, junior jinx. Right. We, by the time we went in and cut Lost and Found, we had been playing half of those songs live. They, we had had all the kinks worked out, and we were recording with Terry Manning, who I don't know about everybody else in the band. I was too stupid to know how great he really was at the time. Um, he captured what the band was all about. You know, Lost and Found was a really good record, but we had most of that. Right. You know, Dan, yeah, I mean, always, Dan always talked about it with the satellites. It, seven or eight years, here's your ten best songs. The second record, we've been out opening for people for a year. We ain't got ten great songs. We've got a song and a half that's good. Right, right. And eight and a half that really ain't that great. You know? <laughs> yeah, but we, I mean, we really pounded it. Yeah. Even... Even with record deals, I mean, it, it, it's not like the sky opened. Right. We still were just, I yeah, mean, yeah. we were lucky enough to go to Europe a lot. How was the reception over there the first time we went? I know they love hillbilly shit. That's why I still rock. get to go, dude, yeah. all these years later. So right from the start, when yeah, you landed there, like... I mean, Heinz kind of hooked the up. Heinz I mean, Hinn, well, who was president of BMI in Europe. He got it, and, and there was some crazy, crazy German guy, uh, Lothar, Lothar Mainz and Hagen. Yeah, and they just got it, and so they they had us doing some weird gigs. Oh yeah, but we got a lot crazy of crazy gigs, like opening for Joe Cocker and shit. I was about to do festivals and things. Oh no, time. dude, yeah. we we did one where we were playing. Uh, uh, the big deal was that man. Thank God Joe's not drinking now. He's doing some great shows. Joe's bus pulls up, it ain't even stopped, the door opens up, and he falls out <laughs> with a beer in his hand, right? And I look, I, I never forget looking at Heinz going, oh, I'm glad Joe's sobered up, you know? He's like, Jesus Christ. But we were literally opening for Cocker, had a, a Learjet, and would load up, fly somewhere else, and play our own club show the same night. Wow. Two shows a day, wow. you know? <laughs> Lotar, Lotar would rent, like, really fast cars uh, for the Autobahn. And he want me to ride with him. And Jack was having a heart, heart attack. attack about it. Sure. It's like Glotar's going to kill Jeff. Well, I mean, you guys weren't exactly calm at that. No, we, were not. we loved we're every not. minute. We loved every minute of but it. But when you wake up and he's flying the fucking plane, <laughs> it ain't cool. The, Lear, the Learjet guy, I'm sitting up front with him, right? And I hound him from the time we take him. Dude, let me fly the plane. Let me fly Come the plane. On, Never flown a plane in my life. 
guy finally lets me going over the cliffs of Dover, right? <laughs> All I'm doing is holding the damn thing. I'm not doing anything, but Jeff wakes up, like, and I'm flying the Learjet. Like, fuck, He can't just lay back down and go back to sleep. Yeah, I mean. Well, he didn't let you land it. Touch no hands. <laughs> no. I mean, he let me hold the yoke. I'm sure he had it with right. a, you know, another idiot. I don't know how to fly a plane. Huh.